All right, everybody, welcome to Mentally Tough Me. Um, as always, it's a total pleasure to have you here. And uh, one of the things we want to do is help you to play better tennis. Um, we've obviously had a tremendously successful academy creating uh, very, very good players, uh, seven number one in the countries, and uh, work with a couple of professional athletes. So, so we certainly do know our stuff. And one of the things that we are extremely strict about is knowing the different strategies. So actually taking the time to, to do the intellectual work, um, going through the various game styles and knowing exactly what to watch out for and knowing what it is that you need to do uh, to do well against that type of player. So, so in today's one, we're going to cover the counter puncher. I know that a lot of people struggle against that style. Um, and it's for a fairly obvious reason, you know, it might not be the prettiest style, but, but generally speaking, points are won um, much more on mistakes than they are on winners. And so when you play against a style that's built to not make a lot of mistakes, um, that eliminates one of the, uh, the most important ways that you can actually get points, right? So, so that puts a lot of pressure on you to make the point. You have to create the openings. And if you don't, they're, they're certainly not going to miss and give you a whole bunch of unforced errors. So, so anyway, let's get into it. So, um, you know, this falls into our, our tennis player game styles, tactics, and strategies. And uh, we're going to start with, with going through the counter puncher, right? Okay, so the first thing we want to know about them is that they tend to hit their targets with a very high percentage of first serves. Um, they're not going to be serving, you know, 20 aces a match, but they're certainly going to get enough first serves in to stop you being an effective offensive returner um, on the second serve, right? And that's their whole goal is, is slow it down a bit, have good targets, but make sure they're not throwing in a lot of second serves where they have to start on defense all the time. Because obviously, as you get older and stronger, when you start playing 16s, 17s, 18s, um, it's not as easy to defend. 12s and 14s, uh, they can probably get away with it, right? Um, yeah, the goal for them is to get started in a neutral position. Uh, the mentality is that they are more patient than you, and they're able to rally for, for longer than you would care to. And so if they just wait around long enough, keeping the ball deep, you're going to start trying to, to, to get in or use the weapon and in doing so are going to, to deliver some unforced errors to them, right? So they're very comfortable in the neutral phase. Their whole style is designed around, I like it here more than you do, and therefore I'm just gonna wait you out. I'm just waiting out the error, right? Um, so, you know, a good example would be Jill Simon. Uh, Caroline Wozniak, he's another one, she, she's retired, um, but very, very good at, um, at getting every ball back. And then when you do attack, very good at blocking that attack and pushing you back to the baseline, right? Okay, so let's just go through there, you know, some of their, their biggest characteristics. So they're very consistent from the baseline. Normally they're solid on both sides. So you're not going to see a weak backhand. Um, really big forehand. Generally, they're fairly similar in skill. Um, they're obviously a very good mover. You know, if you want to wait for somebody else to attack and then counter it, you need to have good eyes, good hands, good ability to read the situation and get there, right? Um, patient, persistent. We spoke about that a little bit earlier. Um, and they're very good at redirecting pace and absorbing power, right? So when you do try to attack, they're very good at taking that ball, that little bunt down the line or to the open court. And if they don't want to do that, um, they're very good at just taking an 80 mile an hour ball and sending it back deep um, at 40 miles an hour, making you generate and do all the work with your legs to get speed on the ball, right? Um, they change pace well. Um, so what they want is, is for you to be trying to attack, but off a lot of different balls, right? Slice moving into the body, faster slice, heavy ball, slow ball, wide ball, just everything they can do to give you different contact points, take away the legs and kinetic chain so that you're trying to attack, but you're off balance. You don't really have your legs under you. Um, and that is their modus operandi, right? Try to get this guy off balance and try to get him desperate to end the point. And hopefully he's going to do both of those at the same time, be off balance and try to win the point. And now you're in trouble, right? Um, 
Okay, so for, for passing shots, um, you know, there's the three major defensive targets. So at the ankles, playing hand hips so are fast at, at the hip with the hand they play with and high backhand. And, you know, they're sitting and waiting, right? They're going like, I know you like the big forehand. And if I give you a short-ish ball and you decide to come in behind it, the question is, can you continue to conclude the point with this really tough, slow, wide ball that bounces at your toes? Um, can you move back, hit the backhand overhead and then cover the court? And if I rifle one straight at you and you reflex it, is that reflex volley going to be short in the middle of the court? And now I'm able to, to get the ball by you, right? So essentially they're you know that at that one step ahead phase right where um they don't mind the big offensive point it doesn't scare them um and when they get there they are then going to to give you two or three shots that are traditionally very difficult to end the point on um and that's where you're in trouble right okay so what are they gonna do a lot of right um, well, the half X, and, you know, we're going to keep the terminology the same as you'd see in the USTA development playbook. Um, it just makes sense. So, you know, there, there are a couple of different names on different continents, but we'll keep it specific to the United States. Um, so, yeah, basically deep corner, short corner, right? Um, and essentially, you know, if I go deep corner, deep corner, it's going to create a V, right? But if I go deep corner, short corner, it's going to create a wider V. And so they're looking to aggressively try to find that short um, T next to the service box um, so they can move you even wider than they would if they just went corner to corner, right? So again, they want your legs. They're hunting down. You know, if they can make you take eight or nine steps before touching the ball every time, they love that because they know that A, you're out of position, B, it's work, and C, if the patience runs out, after doing a lot of work, you're in positions where you traditionally see the alley or the fence close to you when you're going for a winner, which is which is not going to be successful, right? Um, pretty good at keeping the ball deep. Um, so, you know, they like the, the neutral phase. Um, it tends to morph from, you know, the 12s and 14s, the neutral phase is more of a moon ball. And then as you get to 16s, 18s, it's more of a, they're keeping that ball swinging left to right, back behind. Um, to make it that it's it's hard for you to get your feet in the right position for the shots that you want, right? So it's a little bit like trying to do a, I don't know, a drawing while driving in a Jeep over bumps. Um, it's not easy to get that pen where you need it to be, right? Um, they're going to go serve body. Um, again, breaking down the kinetic chain because if you don't get out the way fast enough, you're not going to be able to set the leg. So you're going to kind of push the ball away from you. Um, and then they're going to start with that heavy ball working that high backhand um, over and over again, right? Um, they typically like to use that little short slice to kind of bring you prone um, and then push that ball back behind you. So they like to get you not just moving side to side, but also bring in those diagonals where it's forward, back, and side to side in one, right? Um, so let's have a look um, at this point which just gives you a great idea of um, how much of a pain this kind of style can be. We'll put the volume down here just a smidge. So look at the serve. It's nice, but not overpowering, right? And then they get into that cross court pattern, right? Soft roller, just wants miles on his legs. Short ball, middle of the court. He could easily have attacked that someone, but he decides not to. And you'll notice as Monfils adds pace there, he gets a little bit extra deep, right? And he wants to have enough time to recover back to his marker. So on a cross court ball, he needs to be where my mouse arrow is, right? So he gets all the way back there. Slow. And does he get back? Yes, he does. Down the line, he's going to want to go to there, which he does. 
right? We'll switch it back to the back end diagonal now. Now you see the counter punching. Attacking wall, look at that deep slice, right? He's loving this right now. He's telling himself, this is exactly what I want. 100 balls. I'm still not going to let him have much to work with. Nice down the line. Look at that defensive chip again, right? Short angle. Oh, now he's got him. See how he takes time away? And there, there comes the error, right? So you see how we spoke a little bit earlier about that uses the other person's pace against them. And that was a nice example after that half X ball, you know, that short angle, right, wide. Um, Montice tries to add a little bit of pace and then he just takes that pace and redirects it into the open court, right? Um, so a pretty nice example of, of all of the different items um, inside of one point there, right? And, and we're gonna leave that one here um, so we can just put every, every game style um, in its own thing. So when you come back next time, we'll go through the aggressive baseliner. Um, but yeah, thanks for, thanks for coming with that today. And hopefully that adds to your, um, to your learning repertoire and you are able to build up some strategies to, to, to be successful. Okay. So, and we will go through that at a later time. Um, exactly what you should be looking to do if you are playing against a counter puncher. Um, we're going to do it in three steps. Um, so we'll do it if you are a counter puncher yourself, or if you're an all court player, or if you are a, um, um, an aggressive baseliner, right? Um, and then, yeah, you know, if you, if you guys are interested, I'll drop a link in this video um, to get the tennis player journal because what's in there is, is pretty much the same information you have here. It's nice and summarized for you, so it gives you a nice reference point. Um, it's also got some journal pages in there where you can um, do a pregame and postgame. You know, this is what I'd like to do against this person today. Let me let me have a crack at it, and then after the match, just say, okay, well, how did that work? Um, you know, did I get the results I wanted? Was I close? Um, do I need to completely change tactics next time, or do I just need to train that tactic better so that I can execute it more? Um, so it starts to give you a little bit more of a uh, professional way of monitoring idea versus result coming back from that idea, right? And then the other thing we have in there is just some of the mental pitfalls that you need to watch out for against each style, right? Um, so for example, against the, the, the counter puncher, that frustration and the fact that they're really, really good at what they do um, can sometimes make your risk management go out the window and you start trying to, to almost bully your way to the finish line. Um, and of course, what ends up happening is you're going for, for far too fast at far too small of a target and the unforced error rate starts to click up, right? Um, so you've got to kind of find a balance between going and looking for ways to finish the point, but not um, having too many unforced errors. And, you know, it's a math problem, right? Let's just do the math quickly. So if you have 10 points um, and four out of 10 are unforced errors against the style, um, then they only need to win one out of the next six points for it to be 5-5, five, five, right? A 50% margin. Um, and you're not really getting anywhere, right? And then if they win two out of the next six points, um, they've got a winning edge on you, right? So even three unforced errors out of 10 points here, um, or four, is, is more than enough to, to put you in a real, real danger, right? Um, so anyway, we'll, we'll go through it in a future episode, but, uh, you know, thank you for stopping in on this one and, uh, just keep this in your library. I'm sure it'll be valuable. All right. Bye for now.